All right. And for the women, I'm a polygamist, so if you don't want to be a co-wife, don't flirt with Dr. Umar. Okay? I'm just telling you. You might look good, but I'm going to have two, because I got a lot of work I got to do. Okay? No, but hold tight, hold tight, though. It's only going to be one wife per continent, though. So if I marry a sister in America, the other one is either going to be in London, or Africa, or the Caribbean. You feel me? So you ain't got to worry about no other sister like living in the house with you. I don't do that polygamy, okay? But I'ma have two queens. I'm just letting you know you can't change my opinion, all right? So I just wanna be clear. So I've given you informed consent, okay? Informed consent. See, brothers, y'all just got to be honest with it. Y'all be lying about it. Just say what it is and let them decide. So when we talk about male-female relationships, it's a very important topic. Why, y'all? Because if we don't fix the family, we won't be able to fix anything else. The home is the first institution. And as it goes, so does everything else. I mean, after all, all mental illness comes from the family. You do know that, right? Whether you're depressed, alcoholic, marijuana smoker, whether you're a pedophile, homosexual, bipolar, borderline, schizophrenia, narcissistic, all illness come from mommy and daddy. And who else helped them raise you? Which could be grandma, grandpa, auntie, uncle, and cousins. So if we want to reduce the mental illness of Africans, we got to reduce the psychopathology of the black family. So let's talk about the top eight reasons why black people have relationship problems. This is gonna be your only slide and we're gonna finish the rest of it over at the House of Rent. So when we get over there, we're gonna talk about the six types of men that women need to look out for. Y'all do know what they are, right women? The pimp, the player, the predator, the couch potato, the impregnator, and the professional. Fellas, six types of women you need to look out for. The home wrecker, the healer, Miss Hot in the Pants, High Maintenance, and the Homicidal Honey. But we'll get to that at the House of Rand. Number one reason why our relationships don't work, self-hatred. Too many of us are looking for somebody to love us because we don't love ourselves. How many of us go out dating because I don't like who I am, so I'm going to find somebody else to like who I am? See, the problem with relationships is we trying to give the responsibility of happiness to somebody else. Now, the problem with that is what? Can't nobody make you happy but you. So when I hear my sister say, I'm looking for a man to make me happy, you'll never find him. Because no man can make that. When I hear a brother say, I'm just looking for a sister to give me peace of mind. Can't no sister give you peace of mind. She'll give you a piece of her behind. And that ain't going to do nothing but stir up your mind. You have to be a good friend to yourself in order for somebody else to be a good friend to you. Stop dropping off your emotional, psychological baggage on somebody else's front steps. Giving them the responsibility of fixing all your mental mess. And then we blame the other person for why we miserable. We good at this, right? You was miserable before you got in the relationship. But you got with him or her hoping they would undo your misery. After six months in the relationship, they have failed because it's an impossible task. And do you know what you do? You go tell everybody they're the reason that you're depressed. No, they not. Your ass was depressed two years ago. And you've been depressed. And you're going to stay depressed until you accept responsibility for your own mental condition. Number two, 
Security. Looking for unmet needs from our childhood. This is important. Every one of us, when we was born, we needed four things from our mother and our father. If you got all four from mom and dad, you's a healthy adult. You could go into relationships and never become a stalker. You could go into relationships and never be controlling. You could go into relationships and never be promiscuous. Your man walk out on you, you say, oh well, his loss, I'll find another. Your woman can walk out on you, you say, oh well, her loss, I can find another. You healthy, you can bounce back. But if you didn't get these four things from mom and dad, you likely to end up crazy, deranged, stalking people, terrorizing their Twitter accounts. What are these four things? Love, trust, reciprocity, and intimacy. Love, trust, reciprocity, and intimacy or attachment. Let me give you an example. You got a sister. She didn't grow up with her father. She still needs that masculine energy that she never got. Because she never got it from her dad and her mother didn't supply her with a male role model who would give it to her, when she starts dating, guess what? Subconsciously, she's hypervigilant for men's approval. So she's likely to go in and out of bad relationships because she don't give herself enough time to choose wisely. Because she got an unmet need for love from a man because of the father's absence. This sister will get into a relationship. She'll get used, abused, exploited until she realizes the reason why you keep attracting the same type of man is because every one of them promises you what you never got from daddy. And until you recognize that, they'll continue to use you. Take a man who mother never spent time with him. There was no love there. He'll get into relationships with women and he's gonna end up becoming one or two things. Do y'all know what that is? Either he's gonna be a whip where women can use him, walk over him, take advantage of him, and throw him away. Or he's gonna be very guarded where he never opens his heart and allows a woman to love him. Ladies, you ever date a man who was a good man? He was good to you, good to your kids, paid the bills, didn't cheat, but he never let you love him. And then you say, well, Dr. Umar, I love everything about this man except the fact that I can't love him. What do you think? What do I think? Let me ask you a question. And this is what we all need to ask ourselves before we get into long-term relationships. Can you live with her or him as they are if they never changed for the rest of your life? Because relationship problems don't get smaller over time, they get bigger. And the fact that he don't let you love him ain't gonna disappear. Guess what? It's gonna grow bigger and bigger until you ended up walking away when if you would have realized up front that even though he was 95% of the man you needed, he wasn't 100% of the man you wanted. Which is why women should never date men until you see how he treats his mother. Because if a man don't like his mother, he damn sure ain't gonna like you. Now in the beginning, it might look good. But trust me, at some point in the relationship, you gonna wake up and you gonna look just like her to him, psychologically. You are going to metamorphose into the mother who mistreated him. And then the domestic violence kicks in. Fellas, it's the same thing. A sister hates her father. And you think that's going to work? It might take five years. It might take 20 years. It might take 40. But as sure as I'm standing here, you are going to turn into the father the minute you piss her off and wake up her pain body. And you're going to catch all the hell she really wanted to give to daddy. Y'all know what I'm talking about because some of y'all already done it. We're going to talk about the pain body over at the house. Now listen. I didn't say she had to like her father. I said she can't hate him. Ladies, I didn't say he had to like his mother. I said he can't hate her. It's the intense negative emotion that leads to that type of a situation. Then we got trust. If you couldn't trust your dad to keep his word, if you couldn't trust your mom, her word, it doesn't matter how good of a man or woman you find, you will never trust nothing they say because you ain't been taught trust. See, many of us will run away the best of women, the best of men, 
because we are hyper vigilant for relationship failure because the relationship with our two parents failed in childhood. Your childhood is predictive of what you're going to go through in your adult relationships if you don't become conscious of how the deficiencies operate. Number four, reciprocity. What do I mean when I say reciprocity? You ever date a stingy ass person? <laughs> they, your birthday, they, their birthday come around, you buy them gifts, take them out, cook dinner, Beyonce tickets. And then your birthday come around and all you get is a damn text message or an e-card or a Facebook inbox. You say, I do everything for him, he don't do nothing for me. I do everything for her, she don't do nothing for me. Do you know what that is? That's a person who too afraid to show they care because they afraid you'll take advantage of them. These people are scared and they are guarded and you can spend the rest of your life trying to prove to them that you won't hurt them and it won't mean a damn thing. And then we got what? Intimacy or attachment. That's the fourth thing we need from mommy and daddy. You know what intimacy attachment is? That's when not just they love you, but they show it. They hug you. They kiss you. They joke with you. They play with you. They take you out. They hang around the house with you. They want you with them when they go out. That's called intimacy. You can love somebody and not be intimate. Black men, we have a big problem with intimacy. Most of us just running there. We want the cookie, and then we go. And the sister like, damn, that's it? What about the intimacy? Can you hold me? Can you hug me or something? No, I don't do all that. Because your ass is scared to love. And if you're scared to love, life really ain't worth living. You can get all the cookies you want. Because, men, we suffer from a cookie penile syndrome. We run around sampling all the cookies in Wilmington. Butter pecan, butter almond, cocoa, caramel, lemon. And your ass still unhappy. You're like, damn, I done had half of Wilmington and I'm still unhappy. Because you never experienced true love. And until you had it, you don't know what it is. Intimacy is very important. People who don't get it tend to do what? Become very clingy to people. Try to force them to spend time with them. Try to dictate their life. You can't do that. Ladies, find out what daddy didn't give you so you can't be used by men who promise to do so. Fellas, find out what mommy didn't give you so you can't be exploited by women who promise to do so. Next. We just doing this one slide. Oh yeah. We have materialism. Buying happiness. How many sisters say, I just want a man with a good job, no kids, nice car, master's degree. You can get all that, honey, and you still be unhappy. Too many black women are passing over good men because he don't fit the ideal partner that your ass drew up in sixth grade. You got to give up that damn sixth grade superhero. You talking about you can't find no good man. Brother, pick up your trash twice a week. He's single. No children or he might got one that he take care of. Never been married. Got a job with benefits, retirement. He can't get your Oprah's house, but he can get you a nice one. But guess what? You ignore his ass because he don't meet the criteria of some superficial Eurocentric idea of what a husband's supposed to be. Your ass deserves to be single for the rest of your life. You don't want a man who picks up trash, but you don't mind picking up another woman's trash all your life. <laughs> Fellas, we do the same thing. If the waist ain't small, if the ass ain't big, if the breasts ain't plump, 
you don't want it. But you fail to realize that once you drop a couple seeds on you, stuff gonna start to sag. It's called gravity. But if you love the woman on the inside and you're not attached to the phenotype on the outside, things will be all right. See, sisters know this and you overlook sisters because they might be full figured or might have a white ancestor so they got a flat back or whatever the situation is. You got to understand something. A lot of the women you overlook it might have been the one, but because you committed to the Beyonce look, you never get what you're looking for. And some of you damn conscious brothers is hypocrites like hell. You talk like you black, and then when your woman cut all that perm off and get rid of her wig and cut off the extensions and come home and say, honey, look, you be like, damn! I said I was conscious. I didn't say I was that damn conscious. <laughs> Sisters know what I'm talking about. You want to wear a dashiki and all that, but you still want the hair to be European. I see y'all Negroes out there. Let me go to number five so we can wrap this up. Post-traumatic relationship disorder. Not post-traumatic slavery. We all got that shit. I said post-traumatic relationship disorder. Do you know what that is? That's when you was in a relationship for like two or three years and you really loved a person. Y'all might have lived together or had a couple kids, was engaged, was married, went through some tough times, and y'all decided to break up last week. But you back at the club this week. You ain't gave your womb, black woman, time to heal. And what black women fail to realize is that your vagina is a back road to your unconscious. And when you have too many male energy swimming in your damn womb, you are likely to go crazy. And that's why some of y'all got nasty ass attitudes because you got too many different energies swimming all up in God's womb. And brother, although we are external and we are the givers, you still suck up some of her energy. And before you move on to another sister, you got to make sure that sister's energy is out of your aura. Because if you don't, you will meet a good person and run them away from you. Because you're still treating them based on what the last person did to you. Now you say, well, how much time do I need between relationships? Well, that's relative. It depends on how deep you was in the relationship. It depends on how deep your unmet needs were. But on average, you need at least a season of no sex and no dating. That's three months. Some of y'all love so hard, you need a year. Sometimes you need two years. If you was in a 20 year marriage, you ain't gonna be able to shake that shit off in a month. And then some of y'all got this thing that says if they out of sight, they out of mind. What do we say, fellas? The best way to get over an old love is with a new love. That's a bunch of bullshit. Let me tell you how it works. You out with your new queen. You ain't seen your baby mom in like a year. And then she shows up at the restaurant. And your queen never seen your baby mom. But women got this spidey sense. And she like, I don't know who the hell that is. But when she walked the hell in here, your silence stood up. And I'm feeling all kind of electric in this mother, even though y'all ain't even make eye contact. I'm smelling cookies and everything. <laughs> Fellas, you seen it with the women, didn't you? You out with a sister and a brother walking there? you like, damn, he must have hit that because this is some energy coming in here. And she like, I ain't seen him in five years. And she might be telling the truth. But what you fail to realize is when you don't take time out to fast, where y'all stopped is where y'all will start, even if it's 50 years later. You got to get over one before you move on to the next. But the reason we can't do that is most of us hate being alone. We can't stand solitude. And psychologically and spiritually, why don't we like solitude? 
After all, if you study spirituality or any religion, all the prophets did what? Experience solitude as a way to reach God consciousness. The reason your ass don't like being by yourself is because silence is the mirror that reveals to you all the shit from your past that you need to be working on. And you don't feel like all that. So you know what you're going to do? You can go find a relationship. <laughs> because y'all do know we got spiritual vampires in the black community. What's a spiritual vampire? Brothers and sisters who look like regular people. And do you meet them at the conscious lecture? You meet them at the club? At the back to school meeting? And they real nice people when the sun is out. <laughs> but when it get dark, they get real damn nasty with you. They start growing things and shit, talking to you any kind of way, making your life a living hell. These are unhappy, miserable people who when they find happy people, like to attach themselves to their spirit and suck their ass dry. And you better be careful about them spiritual vampires. Because they can suck the life out of you. Fellas, you ever had a homie who always liked to do stuff with you? Run a little bit of rock? Go to some shows? Hang out? Let's go play some pool? He got with a certain woman, and his ass is just always tired. You're like, dog, you coming out tonight? No, dog, I'm tired. Well, your ass don't even work. Why are you tired? <laughs> you see him? He got bags under his eyes, lost like 50 pounds. Like, damn, dog, you got the virus? No, nah, I ain't got the virus. Well, something, you ain't been the same since you got with that woman. You know why? Because she's a parasite, a spiritual vampire, sucking her ass. And you know what's bad? Sometimes we marry spiritual vampires. And by the time you wake up and realize you married one, they just suck so much of your life energy that nobody else wants you when they're done with you. Y'all better be careful out here. Because unhappy people love to make other people's lives a misery because hurt people love to hurt people. And then we got tyranny of the inner child. The pain body experience. What is a pain body? You got one, I got one, we all got one. Pain body is an aspect of your psyche that holds all the negative memories you ever had of relationships in your life. Every ex-boyfriend, every ex-girlfriend, baby mom, ex-husband, but most importantly, mommy and daddy and brother and sister. And that pain body live inside you. It's the little you. See, y'all think that because you're 35, you automatically are psychologically 35, but we have two ages, biological and psychological. Biological, Dr. Umar be 39 on August the 21st, God willing. But psychologically, I could be 12. Now, ladies, how are you going to know my psychological age? When something don't go right in our relationship, <laughs> the person I transform into when we have a difference of opinion, that's my psychological age. <laughs> Some of y'all dating 12-year-old boys. So when they get mad, they throw a temper tantrum like they four. Some of you fellas are dating eight-year-old girls. She might be 40 biologically, but she only four psychologically. Can you put up with that? See, you don't grow psychologically automatically. You have to force that growth. Some of us are still stuck where we are where our parents stopped raising us. And we're looking for other people to do it for us. Now, the pain body got three criteria. How often does your pain body wake up? Does your pain body wake up once a year or every damn day? How long does your pain body stay awake? Does it stay awake for five minutes or five months? How intense is your pain body? Is it mild or is it so significant that whenever she has a bad day, brothers, you got to go live with your brother till she calm the hell down. <laughs> you better understand the person's pain body you dating. See, the reason why the divorce rate is so high amongst black people, because most of us get married when everything's perfect. 
You never marry somebody because everything is perfect. You don't decide to get married until you see them under stress so you understand the pain body, the inner child, and the psychological age. Because if you marry somebody just because we never had a problem and all people got problems, you only marry half of the person. And then people ask the question, what is it about marriage, engagement, cohabitation, and childbirth that brings out the worst in people? There's something called the ego, and we all have one. See, ladies, when a fella dating you, we put on his front, right? But the ego don't like the front, because a man feel he should be able to be who he is when he feel like it. But I got to act this way. So when we move in together, now we're in close proximity. It's hard to be an actor all the time. <laughs> I used to hold the door open for you for 10 years while we were dating. I used to call you every night before I went to bed for 10 years while we were dating. We moved in together for one week. I ain't opened up the door yet, ain't called you, ain't said goodnight, and you like my God. What's wrong with him? Nothing. He simply stopped acting and started being himself. And that's why I disagree with the religious leaders who say you should not cohabitate before you get married. That might have been true back in the desert. But this is 21st century black America, and we got people with some serious issues. If you don't believe me, black women, do you know most black women who are killed in this country are killed by the person who was supposed to love them? You must live with that man, brother. You must live with that woman. You seen her with the wig on. You seen her with the lipstick on. But did you ever wake up with an ass without it? <laughs> Have you smelled his bad breath? Have you smelled her bad breath? Do you know if he cleans up after himself? Do you know if she cleans up after herself? Have you seen them around your kids? Have you seen, have they seen you around? Gotcha, around their kids. You have to study the person before you get married. Now, ladies say, well, if I move with him, he won't marry me. That's not true. Give him a sample so he know what he's going to get. But make sure it's on a timeline, ladies. Tell the man up front. In my opinion, two years of cohabitation is the max. If he has not proposed to you in two years, you need to move the hell on because it does not take more than 24 months to make up your damn mind. And in conclusion, the values. You have to study his and her values. What are the five major values? Money. Do they like to spend or do they like to save? Religion. Do they believe in spirit work and spending time doing that or not at all? Friends. Do they think they should have a right to hang with their friends more than their family? Or vice versa. Number four, in-laws. Do they let all their family participate in your marriage and make decisions and keep nothing private? Or do they keep it private? And the other one is how y'all raise the children. See, I believe in homework. If I marry a woman who don't believe in homework, we gonna clash. Because I want to make sure my children are successful in life and she could care less. Study the person's values before you decide to get married. I share. Beautiful poetic language, the Arabic language of Assalamu Alaikum, but it simply means peace be unto you. I got a special guest on our show today, my brother from Philadelphia, Brother Umar Johnson. Brother Umar Johnson, would you like to introduce yourself to the listening audience and tell them a, a few things about yourself? Uh, sure. I'm Dr. Umar Johnson. I'm a certified school psychologist and a doctor of clinical psychology, also an educator and a political scientist and a pan Africanist. I work with our young people in the schools. My job is to evaluate children. I decide who goes into special education. I try to fight to keep our young children out of special ed, especially the boys. 
and special education is being used as a weapon of mass destruction to marginalize an entire generation of males of color to prevent them from being successful and ultimately to exterminate them if possible. I'm also trying to educate the community about the psychosexual war against African youth, which is confusing our young people about what and who they actually are. And of course we have the ADHD war and the psychiatric medication and the juvenile incarceration war. So what I try to do is equip our parents and members of the community who care about our young people with the necessary information so that they can fight and protect our people from this slaughter of psychiatric and educational racism. Yes, sir, Brother Umar, I thank you for coming on the show. Thank, and thank you. you for giving us your uh, precious time. No problem. And uh, we're going to get right to the questions, brother, sure. if you don't mind. Brother, in uh, the city of Philadelphia and in the city of Chicago, they say they're closing down the public schools in, the, yes, uh, sir. in, in those uh, states. And But they're also saying on the other side of it that they're building prisons. Yes, sir. Uh, would you like to speak on that, brother? Uh, uh, very much so. When you look at the history of public education in America, particularly as it relates to African people, you'll find that it was only uh, initiated for us to make sure we had a minimum basic skills education so that our labor could be properly exploited by capitalism. But now capitalism is no longer in need of black labor because they've been able to outsource it to second and third world nations and also ship factories out to the suburbs. So black people are no longer needed in order for the American economic process to continue. So they've decided since there's no longer a need for educated black people, why not just get rid of public education altogether? The interesting thing about public education is that the Constitution doesn't guarantee anybody a right to an education. Uh, the, word, the Constitution doesn't even mention the word uh, education. And so education was actually born to die for black people. It was never supposed to be a permanent institution. It was temporary. Only around as long enough as we were needed. And because we're no longer needed, every state which controls both the incarceration and the education system have decided to switch their emphasis to educating to incarcerating. So rather than preparing black people for a life of economic investment, black people have become the investment in the form of mass incarceration. When you study criminology and sociology, you find that whenever there's a need for labor, you don't have high incarceration rates. But whenever there's not enough jobs, crime goes up because stress goes up and also uh, hopelessness goes up and desperation grows up. So there has always been a direct inverse relationship between employment and incarceration. But whenever you hear conversations taking place about black on black crime, you never hear people connect that black on black crime to the economic devastation that black men are dealing with. Yes, sir. And Brother Umar, I'd like you to speak to the parents that are out there in the listening audience. And I was, maybe you could teach them or, or tell them how it would be possible to bridge the gap between the natural learning processes of black children and the unnatural learning process of the European on the black child. Well, here's the thing about education for our children. Public education in America was based on the church model of education. It was the churches that first built the public schools, and public school has stayed true to the church form of education. When you go to church on Sunday, you sit there, and there's a pastor at front, and you hear a sermon and a whole bunch of other stuff for about two or three hours, which is fine for adults on a Sunday. But when you are expected to sit still for seven hours a day, five days a week, that's difficult for even adults to do, more or less children. So what we're doing is we're subjecting our children, boys in particular, to an unnatural form of learning. The cognitive neuroscience has demonstrated through its research that children learn best when they are active, when they are up, and when they are participating in the educational process. So if cognitive neuroscience is underscoring the need for an active educational process, how do we justify a system that forces our children to sit still and be lectured to for seven hours a day? And not only sit still and be lectured to, but be lectured to by a group of middle-class white females who really aren't interested in teaching them in the first place. You cannot separate the educational devastation of black boys from the fact that they're being taught by a 93% predominantly white middle class white female teacher base that could care less whether or not the black boy learns at all. The children of the parents who fought to keep black children out of white suburban schools, it is their children who are now educating our children. So it's kind of ironic that the people who fought to keep us from coming into their schools have now given birth to a generation of white teachers who are now responsible for teaching the children who they fought so diligently against coming into their own public schools. Mm. Can you speak on a little bit about how 
you know, because I, I told you earlier last week when I talked to you that uh, I teach at a daycare, four and five year olds, and uh, the children seem to be doing fine. And it, it seems to be, even though they're they're uh, poor children, uh, uh, economics has nothing to do with the learning process of young children. It yes. has to do with what the parents do to back up that learning process. Yes, uh, it does. So what I wanted to ask you was that uh, W. D. E. B. Du Bois said, "No, this is where I wanted to go with that." If I don't discipline my child, if I do discipline my child, then I'm going to jail, right? Mm -hmm. If I discipline my child physically, then I'm going to jail, right? Mm -hmm. But if I don't discipline my child, then he goes to jail. Yeah. It's almost like a catch-22. Uh, it is a catch-22. Here's the thing with the discipline. One thing the black community has to stop doing is taking direction from people outside of it. That's right. We can't let white people dictate to us how we raise our children. We've never done that before, but we're allowing them to do it now. And we actually gave them the authority to do that once we started buying into their psychological and psychiatric diagnoses. See, when we started letting them tell us what was wrong with our children, that opened up the door for them to start dictating how we raise our children. Had we kept our own business to ourselves, we wouldn't be in this situation. But I also want to say this too, I have been a part of a lot of situations where uh, the Department of Human Services has threatened to take children out of the home and I noticed that they deal with us based on how we deal with them. So if you're a black father or black mother who wants to make it clear to the social service agencies of America that this is my child and this is my house and I'm going to raise them as I see fit and you do that without no sign of fear of what they can do, they tend to leave you alone. I noticed that the parents who tend to get their children taken away from them are the ones who tend to acquiesce to the power and authority of the situation. Mm -hmm. So if you're willing to stand up for your parental rights, they tend to walk away from you. But it's only those of us who cowardly back down and allow them to dictate what's going to happen. They're the ones who end up getting their children taken away from them. Mm -hmm. uh, Brother Umar, uh, I got something here from uh, W.E.D. Du Bois, and he, he said that the Negro was born with a veil, but is gifted with second sight. In this American world, a world which yields him no self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world, the white world. One ever feels his two-ness, one as an American, one as an African, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconcilable strivings, two warring ideas, all in one dark body. What he's talking about right there is the double consciousness or the post-traumatic slavery disorder that African people continue to suffer from. And it's interesting, I actually give him credit for admitting that because I think W.E.B. Du Bois is the quintessential example of a black bourgeoisie. Yeah, he was against uh, Brother uh, Marcus Garvey yes. uh, big time. Yes, he was. And uh, he helped destroy the Garvey movement. You know, not to take away the good of W.E.B. Du Bois, but I think his example you know, is so symbolic with for it demonstrates so much of the struggles that a lot of educated black people suffer from the day. As Dr. Carter G. Woodson said in his seminal work, The Miseducation of the Negro, the more education you get, the less benefit you are to your people. You actually end up becoming, as Marcus Garvey would say, a black white as opposed to a black person. And that's why the more educated black people we've had, the worse condition we've been in. The more black elected officials, the worse condition we've been in. The more black millionaires, the more black megachurches, the worse condition that we've been in. Because the educated black person has been transformed into an educated white person who's simply black on the outside. And the interesting thing about the Talented Tenth or the black bourgeoisie is that even though they work to sell out the best interests of black people and work against our greater need, they tend to consider themselves a credit to the race even though they do nothing for the race. The average black doctor or lawyer thinks that he should be celebrated by his people although he does nothing for his people. And I think President Obama is a very good example as well. Someone who has done absolutely nothing for black people but yet and still wants to be championed as a credit to the people. And we need to be careful about that because we're raising an entire generation of black children to actually look up to these types of sellouts. Yes, sir. And so we're confusing the babies because on the one hand we're telling them about the struggle and we're telling them about Marcus Garvey and El Hajj Malik El Shabazz 
best. But then on the other side, we're telling them about Al Sharpton and Oprah Winfrey and Barack Obama, that these are two different types of personalities. So our children are now getting confused because on the one hand, they understood the sacrifice of a king and a Malcolm. But then on the other hand, they said, well, Obama never done nothing for black people. Neither has Oprah. So if we're going to champion them as celebrities, then maybe it's okay for me to be a turncoat to our community. And if we keep on holding up examples of sellouts to our children, then we can't be upset when they become sellouts themselves. That's right. That's right. You know, and I was watching something on RT News this week where they had four white people on a panel and they were talking about race in this country. And the first thing they said was the only thing that Barack Obama has done for black children is to make them feel good. That's it. He said, they said if you go into black community, it's the exact same or worse than it was before he got there. And the only possible thing he may be able to do is get his two little daughter good jobs. Yes, and he probably Out of being president. And that's all. But I think that we have fallen for the hoax. I mean, the house Negro syndrome is as old as slavery. The tokenism is as old as slavery. Choosing a black person to represent the illusion of inclusion or the idea of progress goes back hundreds of years. So when Obama got elected, I was kind of uh, taken aback by how so, so many I. blacks, uh, so particularly I. in the revolutionary and the conscious community, I mean, the everyday African is confused and ignorant. But when I look at those who continue or consider themselves to be in the know, I was confused at how so many of them mm -hmm. actually acquiesced to the Obamaism and bought into the belief that things were actually changing. I mean, I'm talking about die-hard revolutionaries, not just young brothers and sisters, but even elders who were die-hard nationalists, die-hard Garveyites, die-hard Pan-Africanists, you know, who actually bought into the belief that things were changing just because a half-black man occupied the White House. Mm -mm -mm. Yes, sir, brother. Uh, also, brother, with the dropout rate at high schools, is it that these teachers are not uh, giving our children work that's going to make their minds, you know, light the fire of uh, education in their minds, or is it that they putting our children to sleep uh, as far as education? I'm talking about why they're dropping out, because we do know when a child gets on that Xbox game, he plays attention all day long, but when he's in that classroom, he don't pay attention, so that... Two takes on that. Uh, number one, there's no such thing, in my opinion, as a dropout rate, there's only a push-out rate. Okay. Our children are pushed out by the miseducation and the uh, differential treatment that they receive. Uh, in most high schools in this country, a child can be dropped from the role after being absent a certain amount of days. Okay. No one needs to have to go look for that child. There's no truant officer sent out. There's no investigation. There's no parent contact. They're simply invisible at that point. So there's a high school push-out rate. We, I've seen principals tell students, even black principals, if you don't want to be here, leave. They tell them to leave, literally. And so we have to recognize that the reason why black children tend to drop out so heavily in the ninth grade is because ninth grade is the year of reality. It is in the ninth grade when you realize that the education that you didn't get from kindergarten through eighth grade has not prepared you for what you're going to need to do in high school. And high school is almost like college because there's really not a lot of teachers on that level who's going to put the interest and effort necessary to make sure you benefit. So if you can't read by the time you get the ninth grade, you're not likely to be taught. If you can't read by the time you get the 10th grade, you're not likely to be taught. In fact, we know that if you can't read by the time you finish the 4th grade, you're not likely to learn how to read up until the 12th grade. So you can literally go from 4th grade to 12th grade and never have learned how to read despite going through all those grades. So it clearly shows you that high school is not really interested in educating black children. The other thing is I don't think public school is keeping pace with the technological innovation of American society at large. As you said, you got iPod, Xbox, all of these video games. We live in a fast-paced, technologically sophisticated world. But when you walk in the, in, into the average inner city, Title I public school, you don't see technological sophistication. So you have a child outside of school from 3 p.m. until he goes to bed, if he goes to bed, he's, he's uh, consistently inundated with technological devices. He comes to school at 8 in the morning, stays there until 3 o'clock, 7 or 8 hours, no technology whatsoever. So you're actually revving the brain up from 3 until bedtime. So the brain is constantly being mesmerized by fast-paced colors, sounds, and images. And then he gets to school and all of a sudden he has to put the brakes on his brain. If you study brain neuroscience, you'll find that the brain doesn't function like that. After being revved up, it tends to stay revved up for a while. And even when it begins to come down, guess what? School's out. You go back home to the computer. It revs up again. And so what happens is that the brain has been uh, programmed or conditioned to function at a certain speed. 
And when they come to school, they expect it to slow that speed down, which is not normal or even healthy for that matter. And so we're blaming children because the school isn't keeping pace with the technological speed of the society. How can the child be responsible for the fact that the school isn't keeping pace with the technological sophistication? If you go to suburban white schools, suburban private schools, they have kept pace with technological sophistication. If you go to some of those high school, college prep classes, the classes are done on computer. The classes are done in HD instruction, all types of modern nine modernized pedagogical devices you don't get that in the ghetto and so but the problem with public education is that it has created a system where the child is automatically blamed for the failures of the adults public education is the only institution in this country where the student the customer is blamed for receiving a poor product yes sir and uh, i heard the honorable minister louis farrakhan say that uh, a, ed a college education is almost like buying a used car it very much Once is. Once you come off the lot, you don't you don't know what's going to happen. Very much and so. And the child or the, the, the young person, once they leave with that piece of paper, they don't know that they're going to get a job or not. You exactly. Know, in, exactly. In this society. Uh, brother, we got a couple of charter schools here in Wilmington, Delaware, and they're predominantly black, but all the children are, um, what's it called? Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of it. Uh, uh, special education. Okay. Why is it, how is it that you can have an entire school of black children and all the children be in special education? Well, charter schools are quite interesting, particularly black charter schools, not all of them, but one of the ironies of the black charter school is that most white charter schools have some sort of corporate sponsorship. So they're able to get extra money to take care of the different needs by way of white investors on top of the money that they get from the public school. The way charter schools basically operate is the per pupil expenditure that comes with the child to public school is transferred to the charter school's bank account when that child enrolls in the charter school. Mm -hmm. So if you take Philadelphia where the children get an average of $9,000 per year, if I have a charter school, when that child transfers to my school, they get about $5,500 because the public school charges you like a $500 uh, transfer fee. So you actually get a little less than what this public school district gets. But once I get that money, it might not be enough for me to do all the things that I want to do because I'm being taxed by the local school district when they transfer those funds to my bank account. So I need a little bit more money to do the things that I need to do. If I'm a white charter, I got all these different corporations who are willing to donate money to my school in exchange for some favorable advertisement but if I'm a black charter I'm not necessarily going to get sponsorship from white corporations or even black businesses in my neighborhood so the only guaranteed source of extra funding for a black charter school is special education so believe it or not a lot of black parents take their children out of public school and enroll them in charter school hoping for them to get a second opportunity at a better education but the problem is the child is actually as much as or more likely to end up in special education in a charter school as they did in a public school because the school needs the money. And myself, I do a lot of work with charter schools. I primarily work with charter schools. And I'm telling you, it can be quite a challenge to see some of the so-called Afrocentric educators who deliberately put black boys in special ed when they know they have nothing wrong with them because they're looking for that extra money. So if you take Delaware schools, I think the children get about $6,000 mm -hmm. per year spent on their education. If I evaluate one of those children and I classify them as learning disabled or autistic or emotionally disturbed or intellectually deficient, or deaf or blind or if I say they need special ed for ADHD or speech and language impairment then guess what instead of six thousand the school gets twelve thousand on average it's a 100 percent increase in the funding and you get that money every year so if your child is in the second grade at my charter school or public school once he goes in special ed that extra six thousand that 100 percent increase I'm going to get that every year six thousand times ten more years of school is $60,000 extra because I still get the regular money for him. This is on top of, and that's one kid. What about 1,000 children? What about 100 children? So you see the business aspect of special education. Racism meets capitalism. Yeah, I'm glad you explained that because I didn't know about it. That's why I asked the question. Um, I got another question here for you. This was a speech that uh, a brother done in Atlanta. It was called The Challenge to the Black Man, uh, and the brother's name is Leron Bennett. Historian, yes. Yeah, he he's said, at the million 
I met him at the Million Man March. Okay. He said, he who controls images control minds. Yes. And he who controls minds has little or nothing to fear from bodies. Yes. This is the reason black people are not educated or why they are miseducated in America. It is no accident that there is a blackout on the black man's contribution to the world and American history. An educator in the system of oppression is either a revolutionary or an educator. I want you to speak on that and then I'll finish up the rest of the class. About right. A revolutionary teacher or an oppressive teacher. Exactly. The problem with educators, particularly black educators, is they are caught between a rock and a hard place. If you are a teacher or school psychologist, school nurse, school, school uh, counselor, social worker, principal, uh, reading specialist, math specialist, whatever your particular responsibility is in a public school, private school, charter school, or parochial school, your contract obligates you to the best interests of the district. Okay. So let's say I'm a school psychologist working in Delaware, and they want to put your son in special ed with an emotional and behavioral disturbance. Okay. And I know they're trying to set him up because they don't want him in a school and they want to kick him out. Okay? If I tell you what they're doing, well, if I go to the meeting with you and say in front of everybody that this ain't fair, nothing's wrong with this kid, he's being mistreated by his teacher, that's why he's acting the way he's acting, all y'all need to do is put him in another class and the behaviors will go away. I could lose my job because my contract obligates me to the best interests of the district. And this is why a lot of black teachers are being fired because they're working with parents telling them how to protect their children. That's illegal from a contractual standpoint. You are obligated to the district. Your contract does not give you the right to do what's in the best interest of the children. Mm -hmm. The needs of the district supersedes the needs of the child, even if they conflict with it. So teachers are being fired. Black teachers are being fired all across America for standing up for children. That's one of the reasons I resigned from the school district of Philadelphia. My, my job was not at risk because I was only one of five black male mm -hmm. school psychologists. And I was the youngest of those five, and I had a pretty strong reputation. So there was really nothing they could do with me, but I left of my own free will because I got sick and tired of fighting Negroes over our children. And I want to be clear, it's not the white folk in the black ghetto schools that you got to fight with. Right. Because most of the ghetto schools are run by black principals. Yeah, you follow yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm fighting black people who came from the same communities as the children. They're trying to miseducate. Unbelievable. Yes, sir. Unbelievable. And, it, and it's trifling because it's about money and it's about convenience. Mm -hmm. And the parents are complicit in it because they're so ignorant about educational process. And that's why one of the things I want to do today is kind of teach the parents a little bit about how you can fight some of this nonsense that they're actually pushing on our children. And that's wow. one of the reasons why... I wrote my book to give our people a guide that they can refer to whenever they have an issue to help them navigate those waters. Uh, brother, uh, as a, I'm a member of the Wilmington Peacekeepers, and we've been doing a little committee thing where as though we want to have an event for children this summer. We already got a date and everything. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you the date. It's 29th of June. Okay. And we would be proud if you was to come on out and speak for a half an hour or hour, brother. But I'm asking you to volunteer your time on yes, this sir. right yes, here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Give me the date. If I'm available, I'm June here. June 29th, and I'll stay in contact okay. with you. Text me that date. Yep, yep. Uh, through, through Sister Freedom. But uh, on my last question, I want to ask about the religious aspect of it because we seem to be so great at building churches brother mm -hmm. and Jesus says suffer the little children to come unto me and that's the kingdom of heaven why aren't we building our children brother? One of the problems with black people is we suffer from a messianic complex slavery put that in us uh, where we're expecting someone else to come and fix our problems for us because we don't think we can do them for ourselves hopeless people always cling to religion I'm not saying that if you cling to religion, you're automatically hopeless, but hopeless people do cling to religion because they suffer from a messianic complex. And the messianic complex is born of someone who don't think they have the capacity to impact their own circumstance. I remember I was watching a documentary on the Korean takeover of the black hair care industry, and there was a black man who went to the Korean and he asked the Korean, why don't y'all sell beauty products to black people at wholesale price? Why do y'all sell at an individual price? And the Koreans basically said, we don't have to. He said, y'all people build churches and everybody else build businesses. Yeah. What we have to start doing is making the school or the business the central institution in the community and then build around that. We keep on making churches the yeah. central institution. Yeah. And so everyone understand why the religious institution should not be the central institution is because it doesn't put anyone to work. You have to 
have a solid economic order. And if you have a big church or a big masjid, it's bringing in money, but it doesn't employ anyone. And so when we talk about Jews and Koreans and white folk and uh, East Indians and Arabs coming into our community, robbing us blind financially, well, I would argue that the black church is no different than the Korean corner store. They're also robbing us blind. Yeah. They put their money into white banks, and then those white banks take the Jesus money, and then they invest that Jesus money in the gentrification of black people, so your Jesus money is actually being used to do the devil's work. So we have to reanalyze how we are actually allowing our religious institutions to exploit us financially in the name of Christ. All right, we're going to get one more question, and I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, with these cuts that Barack Obama or the government has done as far as with the kindergarten, the Head Start, and with uh, prenatal care, um, aren't black parents going to have to step up? Black parents are going to have to step up. The whole community, the whole community is going to step up. Retired people are going to have to step up. Yes, we, they are. We are going to have to do this job ourselves. Yes, indeed. The one thing about the cuts, from my perspective, it should not impact or dictate how we respond to the needs in our community. We come from a place where we did things because we had to with our own pennies, nickels, and dimes. But we have gotten so greedy for the free white dollar that so many of our nonprofit organizations and other organizations are not interested in doing anything for the community unless they're getting paid for it. Now, if you can get a grant, fine, okay? But that should not stop you from working for our people and definitely for our youth, okay, because you ain't got no money for it. I remember I was in a meeting with a group of pastors and I asked them why they didn't have a uh, rice of passage program for our young brothers. And they said, well, there's no funding. You know, why do you need funding to spend time with black boys? Why do you need funding to take right. them on camping trips? Why do you need funding to teach our parents? I don't need any money to do that kind of stuff. I do that at the kindness of my heart. So we also have to evaluate ourselves and how we're letting this individualistic American selfishness begin to control the way we do business amongst ourselves. Yes, sir. And uh, we're going to wrap it up right here. Uh, thank brother uh, thank Umar, you. thank you for coming on. Um, yes, sir. And this will be on Tuesday at uh, right. 4.30 to 5 o'clock. Everybody nice. in Wilmington will see it. This is a book right here. It's called Black Children, The Roots, Culture, and Learning Styles by Janice E. Hale. Right here, I'm telling black parents to buy this book when they get a chance to. And this is another book by Gail Thompson, Through Ebony's, Ebony's Eyes, and it talks about what uh, white teachers don't know about black students. All right, as we leave the program, my brother right here is Brother Umar Johnson. My name is Brother Christopher X. Peace.